my second graders. Today we are going to start a new read aloud. And um, you will see how the little mini science experiment um, that I was sharing with you ties into our new read aloud. So this book um, that I'm going to read to you is called The Capture. And the series is Guardians of Gahul. Um, and the author is Catherine Lasky. And so this is book one in a series. So if you like this uh, book when I'm finished, uh, I forget how many books there are in the series. Oh, let's see, book 12. So here's the list of all of the books. So if you like this book, then you can um, enjoy the others after. So I'm going to read you the uh, little write-up on the back to give you more information. But book one is called The Capture. Soren is born in the forest of Taito, a tranquil kingdom where the barn owls dwell, but evil lurks in the owl world, evil that threatens to shatter Taito's peace and change the course of Soren's life forever. Soren is captured and taken to a dark and forbidding canyon. It's called an orphanage, but Soren believes it's something far worse. He and his friend Gilfi know that the only way out is up. To escape, they will need to do something they have never done before, fly. And so begins a magical journey along the way. Soren and Gilfi meet Twilight and Digger. The four owls band together to seek the truth and protect the owl world from unimaginable danger. So you can probably guess the genre of this book. It's not going to be nonfiction and not realistic fiction, but fantasy because the owls are going to be talking and they're going to a magical world. So I'm going to start reading. Um, <laughs> okay, this book has a prologue and that means um, it'll give you a little information about what, like a little backstory. Okay, the world spiraled. The needles of the old fir tree blurred against the night sky. And then there was a sickening sensation as the forest floor raced toward him. Soren madly tried to beat his stubby little wings. Useless! He thought, I am dead. A dead owlet. Three weeks out of my shell and my life ends. Suddenly, something began to soften his fall. A pocket of breeze? A cushion of wind? A downy fluff of air lacing through his unsightly patches of fuzz? What was it? Time slowed. His short life flowed by him every second, second of it from his very first memory. And then chapter one, A Nest Remembered. Noctis, you can spare a bit more down, darling. I think our third little one is about to arrive. That egg is beginning to crack. Down, if you um, have like a down comforter, down is um, the underneath the feathers of owls. It's really warm and soft. So they want to use it for, they have um, a little outlet coming. So they're going to use the now, the down um, for the baby. Not again, sighed Clud. What do you mean, Clud? Not again. Don't you want another little brother? His father said. There was an edge to his voice. Or sister, mother's, his mother sighed, the low soft whistle barn owls sometimes used. I'd like a sister. Soren pe peeped up. You just hatched out two weeks ago. Clud turned to Soren, his younger brother. What do you know about sisters? Maybe, Soren thought to himself, they would be better than brothers? Clud seemed to have resented him since the moment he had first hatched. You really wouldn't want them arriving just when you're about to begin branching, Clud said dully. Branching was the first step, literally, toward flying. The young owlets would begin by hopping from branch to branch and flapping their wings. Now, now, Clud, his father admonished. Don't be impatient. There'll be time for branching. Remember, you won't have your flight feathers for at least another month or more. Soren was just about to ask what a month was when he heard a crack. The owl family all seemed to freeze. To any other forest creature, the sound would have been imperceptible. But barn owls were blessed with extraordinary hearing. It's coming, Soren's mother gasped. I'm so excited. 
She sighed again and looked rapturously at the pure white egg as it rocked back and forth. A tiny hole appeared, and from it protruded a small spur. It's egg tooth! By Glocks! Soren's father exclaimed. Mine was bigger, wasn't it, Da? Clud shoved Soren aside for a better look, but Soren crept back up under his father's wing. Oh, I don't know, son, but isn't it a pretty, glistening little point? Always gives me a thrill. Such a tiny little thing pecking its way into the big wide world. Ah, bless my gizzard, the wonder of it all. It did indeed seem a wonder. Soren stared at the hole that now began to split into two or three cracks. The egg shuddered si slightly, and the cracks grew longer and wider. He had done this himself just two weeks ago. This was exciting. What happened to my egg tooth, Mum? It dropped off, Clud said. Oh, Soren said quietly. His parents were so absorbed in the hatching that they didn't reprimand Clud for his rudeness. Where's Mrs. P? Mrs. P, his mother said urgently. Right here, ma'am, Mrs. Plithifer, the old blind snake who had been with the owl family for years and years, slithered into the hollow. Blind snakes, born without eyes, served as nest maids and were kept by many owls to make sure the nests were clean and free of maggots and various insects that found their way into the hollows. Mrs. P, no maggots or vermin in that corner were not just put in fresh down. Course not, ma'am. Now, how many, how many broods of owlets have I been through with you? Oh, sorry, Mrs. P. How could I have ever doubted you? I'm always nervous at the hatching. Each one is just like the first time. I never get used to it. Don't you apologize, ma'am. You think any other birds would care two wits if their nest was clean? The stories I've heard about seagulls. Oh, my goodness. Well, I won't even go into it. Blind snakes prided themselves on working for owls, whom they considered the noblest of birds. Meticulous, the blind snakes had great disdain for other birds that they felt were less clean due to their unfortunate digestive processes that caused them to eliminate only sloppy wet droppings instead of nice neat bundles. The pellets that owls yarped or spit up Although owls did digest the soft parts of their food in a manner similar to other birds, and indeed passed it in a liquid form, for some reason they were never associated with these lesser digestive processes. All the fur and bones and tiny teeth of their prey, like mice that could not be digested in the ordinary way, were pressed into little pellets, just the shape and size of the owl's gizzard. Several, several hours, after eating, the owls would yark them up. Wet poopers is how many nest-made snakes referred to other birds. Of course, Mrs. Plithifer was much too proper to use such coarse language. So do you see why I um, showed you the videos of the owl pellets? So as you can see from the book so far, the owls are seen as kind of a more dignified bird. And if you think of other books that have owls, I'm thinking of like the Harry Potter series or, um, let me think. I don't know. They're seen as wise. Most people know owls to be like a wise bird. And so it's funny that they talk about how owls um, kind of spit up the owl pellet instead of making wet droppings like seagulls. And if you've ever been to the beach, the seagulls fly all around and you have to be careful that they don't drop on your head, right? And so the owls take pride in their, they're not as messy. Um, Mom, Soren gasped, look at that. The nest suddenly seemed to reverberate with a huge cracking sound. Again, only huge to the ear slits of barn owls. Now the egg split. A pale slimy blob flopped out. It's a girl! A long shree call streamed from his mother's throat. It was the shree of pure happiness. Adorable, Soren's mother sighed. Enchanting, said Soren's father. Claude yawned and Soren stared dumbfounded at the wet naked thing with its huge bulging eyes sealed tightly shut. What's wrong with her head, mom? Soren asked. Nothing, dear. Chicks just have very large heads. It takes a while for their bodies to catch up. Not to mention their brains, Clud muttered. 
so they can't hold their heads up right away, said his mother. You were the same way. What shall we call the little deer? Soren's father asked. Eglantine, Soren's mother replied immediately. I have always wanted a little Eglantine. Oh, Mum, I love that name, Soren said. He softly repeated the name. Then he tipped toward the little pulsing mass of white. Eglantine, he whispered softly, and he thought he saw one little sealed eye open just a slit, and a tiny voice seemed to say, Hi. Soren loved his little sister immediately. One second, Eglantine had been this quivering little wet blob, and then, minutes later, it seemed as if she had turned into a fluffy white ball of down. She grew stronger quickly, or so it appeared to Soren. His parents assured him that he too had done exactly the same. That evening, it was time for her first insect ceremony. Her eyes were fully open and she was bawling with hunger. Eglantine could hardly make it through her father's welcome to Tito speech. Little Eglantine, welcome to the forest of Tito forest of the barn owls, or Tido Alba, as we are more formally known. Once upon a time, long, long ago, we did indeed live in barns, but now we and other Tido cousins live in this forest kingdom known as Tido. We are rare indeed, and we are perhaps the smallest of all the owl kingdoms. Although in truth, it has been a long, long time since we had a king. Someday when you grow up, when you enter your second year, you too will fly out from this hollow and find one of your own in which to live with a mate. This was the part of the speech that amazed and disturbed Soren. He simply could not imagine growing up and having a nest of his own. How could he be separated from his parents? And yet there was this urge to fly, even now with his stubby little wings that lacked even the smallest sign of true flight feathers. And now... Soren's father continued, it is time for your first insect ceremony. He turned to Soren's mother. Someone's at the front door. Sorry for the interruption. <laughs> it is time for your first insect ceremony. He turned to Soren's mother. Morella, my dear, can you bring forward the cricket? Soren's mother stepped up. In her beak, she held one of the summer's last crickets. Eat up, youngum. Head first, yes, down the beak, yes, always, yes, always head first. That's the proper way, be it cricket, mouse, or vole. Mmm, sighed Soren's father as he watched his daughter swallow the cricket. Dizzy in the gizzy, ain't it so? Cud blinked and yawned. Sometimes his parents really embarrassed him, especially his dad with his dumb jokes. Wit of the wood, muttered Clud. That dawn after the owls had settled down, Soren was still so excited by his little sister's arrival that he could not sleep. His parents had retired to the ledge above him where they slept, but he could hear their voices threading through the dim morning light that filtered into the hollow. Oh, Noctis, it is very strange. Another owlet disappeared. Yes, my dear, I'm afraid so. How many is that now in the last few days? Fifteen missing, I believe. That is many more than can be accounted for by raccoons. Yes, Noctis replied grimly, and there is something else. What? His wife replied in a lower wavering hoot. Eggs. Eggs? Eggs have disappeared. Eggs from a nest? Yes, I'm afraid so. No, Morella Alba gasped. I have never heard of such a thing. It's unspeakable. I thought I must tell you in case we are blessed with another broad. Oh, great glocks, his mother gasped. Soren's eyes blinked wide. He had never heard his mother swear before. But we so seldom leave the nest during broody times. Whoever it is must watch us, she paused. Watch us constantly. Whoever it is can fly or climb, Noctis Alba said darkly. Soren felt a sense of dread seep into the hollow. How thankful he was that Eglantine had not been snatched while just an egg. He vowed he would never leave her alone. It seemed to Soren that as soon as Eglantine ate her first insect, she never stopped eating. His mother and father assured him that he had been the same. And you still are, Soren, and it's almost time for your first fur-on-meat ceremony. 
that was what life was like those first weeks in the nest, one ceremony after another. Each, it seemed in some way or another, led to the truly biggest, perhaps the most solemn yet joyous moment in a young owl's life. First flight. Fur, whispered Soren. He couldn't quite imagine what it was like, what it would feel like slipping down his throat. His mother always stripped off all the fur from the meat and then tore out the bones before offering the little tidbits of fresh mouse or squirrel to Soren. Clud was almost ready for his first bone ceremony when he would be allowed to eat the whole bit, as Soren's father said, and it was just before first bones that a young owl began branching. And just after that, it would begin its first real flight under the watchful eyes of its parents. Hop, hop, that's it, Clud. Now up, up with the wings, just as you begin the hop to that next branch. And remember, you're just branching now, no flying. And even after your first flight lessons, no flying by yourself until mom and I say so. Yes, da, Clud said in a bored voice. Then he muttered, how many times have I heard this lecture? Soren had heard it many, many times too, even though he was nowhere near branching. The worst thing a young owl could do was to try to fly before it was ready. And of course, young owls usually did this when their parents were out hunting. It was so tempting to try one's newly fledged wings, but it would almost likely end in a disastrous crash, leaving the little owlet nestless, perhaps badly injured, and on the ground exposed to dangerous predators. The lecture was brief this time, and the branching lesson resumed. Crisply, crisply, boy, keep the noise down. Owls are silent flyers. But I'm not flying yet. As you keep reminding me constantly, what's it matter if I'm nosy now, if I'm noisy now when I'm just branching? Bad habit, bad habit, leads to noisy flight. Hard to outgrow noise habits started in branching. Oh, bother. Oh, I'll bother you, Noctis exploded and gave his son a cuff on the head that nearly tipped him over. Soren had to admit that Clud didn't even whimper, but just picked himself up and gave his da a glaring look and resumed hopping, slightly less noisily than before. There was a series of soft, short hisses from Mrs. Plithifer. Difficult one, that one. My, my, glad your mum's not here to see this. Eglantine, Mrs. Plithifer called out suddenly. Even though she was blind, she seemed to know exactly what the young owlets were doing at any given moment. She now he heard the crunch of a nest bug in Eglantine's beak. Put that nest bug down. Owls do not eat nest bugs. That's what house snakes do. If you keep it up, you'll just grow fat and squishy and won't be prepared for your first meat ceremony. And then no first fur, and then no first bones, and then no, well, you know what. Now your mom is just out looking for a nice chubby bowl with soft fur for Soren's first fur ceremony. And she might even find a nice wriggly little centipede for you. Oh, there's so much fun to eat, Soren exclaimed, all their little legs pittering down your gullet. Oh, Soren, tell me that story about the first time you ate a centipede, Eglantine begged. Mrs. Plithifer sighed softly. It was so sweet. Eglantine hung on to every word of Soren's. True sisterly love and Soren loved her right back. She wasn't sure what exactly had happened with their older brother, Clud. There was always one difficult one in a, in a brood, but Clud was more than just difficult. There was something, something. Mrs. Plith Mrs. Plithifer thought hard, just something missing with Clud, something rather unnatural, unowlish. Sing the centipede song, Soren, sing it. Soren opened his beak wide and began to sing. What gives a wriggle and makes you giggle when you eat them? Whose weensy little feet make my heart really beat? Why, it's those little creepy crawlies that make me feel so jolly. For the darling centipede, my favorite buggy feed, I always want some more. That's the insect I adore. More than beetles, more than crickets, which at times give me the hiccups. I crave only to feed on a juicy centipede, and I shall be happy forevermore. That's my interpretation of how the song is sung. I have no idea. <laughs> Just as Soren finished the song, his mother flew into the hollow and dropped a bowl at her feet. A nice fat one, my dear. Enough for your first fur ceremony and Clud's first bones. I want my own, Clud said. Nonsense, dear. You could never eat a whole bowl. Oh, wool, squeaked Eglantine. Oh, Mom, it rhymes. I love rhymes. 
I want one all for myself, Clud persisted. Now look here, Clud. Morella fixed her son in a dark, steady gaze. We do not waste food around here. This is a very large bowl. There is enough for you to have your first bone ceremony, Soren to have his first fur ceremony, and Eglantine to have her first meat. Meat? I get to eat meat? Eglantine gave a little hop of excitement. She seemed to have forgotten all about the joys of centipedes. And so, Clud, when you want a vole all of your own, you can just go out and hunt it for yourself. I spent most of the night tracking down this one. Food is scarce in Taito this time of year. I'm exhausted. A huge orange moon sailed in the autumn sky. It seemed to hover just above the great fir tree where Soren and his family lived, and it cast a soft glow in through the opening of the hollow. It was indeed a perfect night for the ceremonies that these owls loved and that marked their growth and the passage of time. And so that night, just before the dawn, the three little owlets had their first meat, first fur, and first bone ceremonies, and Clud yarped his first real pellet. It was the exact shape of his gizzard, which had pressed it into the tight little bundle of bones and fur. Oh, that's a fine pellet, son, Clud's father, Clud's father said. Yes, indeed, his mother agreed. Quite admirable. And Clud, for once, seemed satisfied. And Mrs. Plithifer thought privately to herself how no bird could be really bad that had such a noble digestive system. That night, from the time the big orange moon began to slip down in the sky until the first gray streaks of the new dawn, Noctis Alba told the stories that owls had loved to hear from the time of Glocks. Glocks was the most ancient order of owls from which all other owls descended. So his father began. Once upon a very long time ago, in the time of Glocks, there was an order of nightly owls from a kingdom called Gahul, who would rise each night into the blackness and perform noble deeds. They spoke no words, but true ones. Their purpose was to right all wrongs, to make strong the weak, mend the broken, vanquish the proud, and make powerless those who abused the frail. With hearts sublime, they would take flight. Clud yawned. Is this a true story or what? It's a legend, Clud, his father answered. But is it true, Clud whined? I only like true stories. A legend, Clud, is a story that you begin to feel in your gizzard, and then over time it becomes true in your heart, and perhaps makes you become a better owl. Okay, so we're going to stop right there. But chapter two is called A Life Worth Two Pellets. So um, the next time that I read to you, I'm going to read chapter two and chapter three to you. So this just introduces, chapter one introduces the uh, main characters in the book. So I'll have an activity for you um, to the side of the slide for you to answer. Okay, I hope you enjoyed the first chapter.